His steel blue eyes opened, but his taut body remained motionless, like a tightly coiled spring. It was only the faintest sound, a scratch, no more, coming from the upstairs room. But it was enough to wake Jake. He hadn't slept deeply since Iraq. He checked his Ingersoll G300 sat-nav watch. 16.58 hours and 18 seconds. Still another 17 minutes to pointless on the BBC. Minus the 18 seconds. Make that 23 seconds now. Why would anyone be in his bedroom at this hour? There was only one possible reason. It wasn't a good one. The solid state memory device with the evidence that was going to sink the conspiracy of Standard Oil, Bayer Chemicals, Honda and a dozen other evil multinationals was stitched into the Calvin Kleins that hugged Jake's hard round buttocks at this moment. The searcher upstairs was going to be disappointed. <laughs> Doubly disappointed, thought Jake, as he eased from his waistband the Glock 3.2 semi-automatic pistol with a built-in silencer, 2009 model with a blue metallic finish. Like a panther in a jungle, Jake's muscles rippled as he slid from the Tibetan prayer mat on which he had been deep in meditation. He glided over the parquet floor, past the Modigliani portrait given to him by an anonymous but very relieved European government after he'd saved their capital city. The scraping was more obvious now. It was the sound of a drawer opening. Jake knew the sounds of all his drawers. This was the sound of his sock drawer, top left in the chest of drawers. And the searcher had opened it with his left hand. So the stranger had his Uzi cocked in his right hand. Jake could smell the Uzi. He'd learned to smell Uzis in Caracas, Venezuela. The searcher was good, quiet and focused. Sounded like an Eastern European, maybe a Serb. But then most villains these days were Serb. He wasn't going to be good enough for Jake. Jake crossed to the stairs. He caught sight of himself in the hallway mirror. His chin was chiselled. His dark hair was messed up but still thick and lustrous, tumbling over his brow. The biceps bulged under his chest. Six foot three, built like a honed athlete, but with a roguish smile that never failed to charm. His blue eyes twinkled back at him. But then he checked. His dark past momentarily caught up with him. A spasm of pain crossed his rugged features as he thought of the beautiful Tanya, his adoring and devoted lover, who had been crushed by a bulldozer on their last mission to the killing fields of Sumatra. Up the stairs, like a cobra. Along the landing, like a shadow. Past the bathroom, like a zephyr. Past the airing cupboard, like a jet taking off. Jake burst through the bedroom door, his two feet blasting the door off its hinges, his body a blur of incredible speed through the air. He had a sense of slow-motion weightlessness as his presence filled the room. Before he even touched down, he had loosed his bullets. The Glock 3.2 chattered and butt under his firm grip. Jake never missed. The bullets entered through the eye of the victim. The head exploded like a melon. The white walls became Jackson Pollock paintings, splatters of blood and brains. Jake sheathed his weapon. It was hot against his hip. <laughs> he loved that faint bouquet of cordite that the Glock 3.2 gave out when he fired. He loved the gun's blue metallic finish so much that he'd used it on his custom-built Lamborghini. Mrs. McRae lay dead on the floor. He'd be advertising for a new cleaning lady tomorrow. 